Welcome to this ValueBridge.net case study. If you plan to use private equity value creation models to understand the source of a fund or GP's return, you should always include a value driver that accounts for equity dilution and equity concentration. Here's why. The following table provides capital structure and income statement data for a private equity deal. It is a $100 million company with 50 of debt and 50 of equity. As of Q1, the company has TTM EBITDA of 20, so its valuation multiple is 100 over 20 or 5.0. Now, a few quarters go by and these numbers change a bit. TTM EBITDA goes up to 21, but the market comps are down, so the valuation multiple is 4.8. Also, the company burns through a bit of cash, so net debt is now 51. This gives us an enterprise valuation of 100.8, a total equity value of 49.8, and slight changes in the equity and debt ratios. Even though the total equity valuation is basically flat, we still have underlying value drivers that are material. At the company level, they can be explained with these equations. EBITDA growth gives us 2.4 million of value, while multiple expansion takes 2.0 million away. Gearing gives us back another 0.4 million, but then we lose 1 million from the company's cash consumption. These values add up to the 0.2 million equity loss. Now, as investors, we are usually more concerned about the returns of a specific shareholder like a fund or a GP. In this deal, the GP's equity value actually goes up from 30 to 31 million. This may look strange, but it's pretty common. It can happen when a fund owns participating preferred securities. Now, one way to force the company level value drivers to bridge the gap between the 30 and the 31 million is to multiply by the change in fund equity and then divide by the change in total equity as follows. However, this can give pretty strange results, as we see here. In this case, we have flipped the signs of all the value drivers, so they're going in the wrong direction, and values have been amplified, so magnitudes are larger than what you would expect from the modest changes in capital structure and P&L. To fix this, we must bring the GP's fund ownership percentage into the model. The GP owns 60% of the equity in Q1, and then 62.2% of the equity in Q4. To scale the total equity return to the fund, we multiply each value driver by the average holding period equity ownership. In this case, that's 61.1%. This will provide EBITDA growth of 1.5 million, multiple expansion of negative 1.2, gearing of 0.2 million, and cash burn of negative 0.6. If you add these value drivers to invested capital, you see that we get a GPQ4 equity value of 29.9 million, which is 1.1 million short of our 31 million target. The remaining gap is explained by fund ownership impact, which measures the value lost due to equity dilution or value gained due to equity concentration. Multiplying the 2.2% ownership increase by the average holding period equity valuation of 49.9 million gives us fund ownership impact of precisely 1.1 million, and this bridges the gap between the Q1 and the Q4 GP equity valuation. This is really the only way to build a value bridge that is guaranteed to work. Fund ownership impact will be material whenever FI changes by more than 1% or 2%. And that happens all the time in the real world due to things like different investor participation in various financing rounds, participating preferred securities, and the expansion of management team option pools. That wraps up this case study. We ran through all the mathematics quickly in the video, but you can find all the data tables and equations on the case study page at valuebridge.net. Subscribers can also download an Excel template that lets them plug in numbers for different scenarios and see how they affect the value bridge. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you at valuebridge.net.